This is um, one of my favorite talks. Uh, actually, I give a lot of favorite talks here at Mises Hughes. So it's, um, it's, it's my area that I worked on when I was in grad school at Auburn. It was um, uh, environmental regulation was subject to my dissertation. Uh, and I've, I've maintained an interest in this over the years. And it's, I think part of my interest came from the fact that this is a difficult area for a lot of people working in free markets, um, people who are sympathetic to free markets. When it comes to environmental issues, they say, well, maybe we need some government intervention here because it's, you know, we need some regulation in order to prevent firms from releasing massive amounts of pollution because that's what they assume would happen if there were no government regulation here. Let me, um, there's a lot to cover and we've got limited time, uh, but there are two key issues that come up with environmental economics. One is environmental resource use. Uh, so how do we, um, how do we deal with uh, uh, forest, uh, cutting down of forests? Um, uh, what, do we, what do we do about um, the uh, uh, local food kind of uh, idea? Uh, endangered species and, re and, and extinction would be part of this. Um, energy conservation would be part of this. Uh, the fuel economy regulations that you see on automobiles, the notorious cafe restrictions are part of the resource use question. Incidentally, I'll, I, I, I like to start off discussions on this with my classes by mentioning that if they really like trees, they should not recycle paper. Uh, and and they, they sort of looks a little startled, like, what, this is heresy, how, how can you say this? I say, well, think about it. If you decided you liked corn, and you said, well, I'm not going to eat any more corn because I like corn plants, how many corn plants would farmers then plant? So if you like trees, and you, you should then use as much of that resource as possible so that uh, tree farmers then decide to continue to farm trees instead of farming something else uh, or doing something else with that land. So um, that sort of gets people's attention usually because it's, it's just so counterintuitive to the modern way of thinking about these things. The second uh, major piece of environmental issues that we can discuss are externalities. Um, that's the, the term commonly used in uh, economics for a spillover effect, a, a, a byproduct. So if I'm smoking a, a cigarette and uh, somebody nearby breathes my cigarette smoke and is affected by that negatively or positively, then that's an externality. And um, Tom DiLorenzo gave a talk yesterday on market failure, and this is one of those uh, areas where market failure is said to result from from uh, markets or firms not taking adequate account of externalities um, and pollution problems are in that category most most uh, most commonly regarded as a negative externality. Now these aren't really as separate as they might appear because externalities really boil down to questions over ownership of a particular resource. So who owns the air that I'm dumping my um, particulates into as I smoke a cigarette? Uh, who owns the water that is receiving the effluent from some kind of mill? Uh, these are resource ownership questions, so they're, they're really connected. They're not as separate as you might think. Now, there are three basic approaches that you'll see to dealing with environmental problems. One of them is the Pigovian approach, named for Arthur Cecil Pigou, uh, Cambridge economist. Um, and he came up with these ideas about taxing negative externalities and subsidizing positive externalities. And uh, that was supposed to help resolve these problems because then the firm that is generating some kind of smoke uh, would then reduce its quantity of smoke produced if they know that they're going to be taxed per unit 
of the, of the pollution. Or if a firm is producing some kind of positive externality and they know that they are getting a subsidy for it, then they start to take that into account when they decide how much of the, of the, of the uh, product to, to produce. Uh, that's something also that, that Tom dealt with yesterday, but we'll expand on that a little bit today as well. There's secondly a regulatory approach. Uh, this is where the government says we know how much of the pollution is acceptable uh, and we're going to require firms to cut their pollution to that level. So they're going to say uh, um, uh, you can only produce X number of tons of sulfur dioxide uh, from your factory, or they may even say, we're going to require you to use this particular piece of equipment. Um, so your, your cars have catalytic converters on them that uh, convert some of the chemicals coming out of your uh, engine into something a little less dangerous and inert, perhaps, um, so that that's supposed to reduce the impact on the environment. Well, I mean, if, if you came up with some other kind of... Um, method of reducing pollution, um, that may not be something that you could actually use in a vehicle because the government says you have to use this particular technology. Um, so that's sometimes called command and control, command and control uh, regulation. A third approach is the property rights approach, and I'm taking a broad perspective on this. Uh, I'm including here not only the common law perspective, uh, Judge Napolitano talked about the common law a little bit uh, on Monday night, and I hope you were there to hear that. Uh, the common perception that I am picking up from my students on, on environmental issues is that before the EPA, or before there was command and control regulation, then it was just a free-for-all. Firms would just dump stuff into the water, or the air, ocean, and nobody... Uh, could say anything to them about it. It was just a, um, um, I hesitate to use the word, the term Wild West, because as you, some of you may know, the Wild West really wasn't all that wild. Uh, but it, it was an un, unrestrained kind of environment. Uh, that's not the case. There were laws of nuisance, for example, if you dumped uh, pollution into a river and someone downstream suffers from that, they could sue you without the EPA or other regulatory agencies being involved to say how much of the emissions were appropriate and how, how much the firm could produce. That, that was uh, not necessary for firms to be restrained in their production. You had to show that there was actually a harm generated by this firm um, and that was a way of, of, of uh, requiring firms to take account of their pollution. Uh, we're going to talk later about Coase. Uh, you can't really talk about environmental issues here without discussing Ronald Coase, and so um, there are some criticisms that I'll level at Coasean, the, the Coase theorem and, and that kind of thing, so we'll, we'll discuss that in a minute. First, let's look at two of the key problems that we see with the mainstream approach to the environment. Roy Cardato, who's written a book, which I think is in the uh, bookstore here, um, Externalities in an Open-Ended Universe, says efficiency is an individual goal-seeking problem, not a value maximization problem. Why is that important? Well, from the Austrian perspective, Efficiency is attained when legal institutions allow individuals to pursue their ends, whatever they might be. Uh, the, there may be conflicts over the use of scarce goods, but the Austrian doesn't, the Austrian economist doesn't say, well, let's try to figure out what the value of this use is and the value of that use is. Uh, how much value does the water have when people are fishing in it and swimming in it? How much value does the water have when it's used as a, a dumping ground for some effluent? There's, there's no way for us to really make those comparisons because costs are subjective. They cannot be measured. Now, I will say this, and then you'll see if you take a typical 
class on environmental economics, or sometimes this comes into a principles of micro class, you'll see uh, this is kind of assumption that we can actually measure these costs. Um, what you'll see is, is often a graph like this, and I'll spend some time on this because you, you'll, if you take economics courses, you'll probably see this. What you've got on the vertical axis there is marginal private cost, marginal social cost, and marginal private benefit. All right, so let me go through those for a minute. On the, on the uh, horizontal axis is the quantity of the output of the goods you're producing. So if it's a paper mill producing paper, then we're looking at, I don't know how they measure paper, uh, tons of paper or something. Uh, and the marginal benefit to the firm of producing paper, I've drawn as a downward sloping line. It could be less sloping, it could be flat. Um, but that's the benefit to the firm of producing the paper. It's private benefit. That is, if they produce more paper, they get more money, more revenue from the sale of the paper. No big mystery there. Then we have the marginal private cost. Again, I've, I've drawn this as upward sloping, but it, it could be uh, less sloping if, depending on the conditions in the marketplace. But these are the, these are the costs to the paper mill. Their accountant would take a, uh, uh, account of these, these costs. As they produce more paper, maybe they uh, have to go further and pay more for the remaining trees, or maybe they have to pay more for the real estate on which the trees are grown and so forth. So maybe this is an upward sloping line, again, depending on the, the market conditions. Now, the marginal social cost is what you get when you add to the costs of the firm, the paper mill in this case, the external costs on bystanders. If you've been around a paper mill at all, you know it gives off a kind of a rotten egg odor, which most people find unpleasant. Um, and it may generate some other, other effluent. Uh, perhaps it, it uses, from my understanding, it uses a lot of water. The water emitted from the plant might be um, might be uh, uh, polluted to some extent. And so if we add those costs, those external costs on bystanders who are not buyers of paper, not sellers of paper, just standing around being near the paper mill, then you get an additional cost. And the vertical distance between these two lines indicates the amount of that external cost. Now here's the problem. <clears throat> we can't measure this. We don't know. Even if we can figure out, even if the firm says we know what our costs are, how do you measure the impact on a bystander of having a bad smell in the neighborhood? So you can go around with a survey and maybe you, you have a clipboard and you, you knock on doors and you say, well, how much, sir, did um, smelling this rotten eggs odor cost you last year? How do you even put that in, in numbers? If the person is being honest about, trying to be honest about the cost. And that's not even considering the fact that some people might look at the surveyor and say, if I say a big number, maybe, they'll, maybe that'll make it more likely that the firm will be shut down, which is what I really want since I don't work at the firm and I don't buy paper and I don't, I don't want to smell rotten eggs. So if I say, five million dollars or something, uh, then uh, maybe the surveyor will dutifully write this down and turn that in and it'll be more likely that the firm will be shut down. Or maybe the person says, well, I work at the paper mill. I, you know, I don't like the bad smell, but I don't want to lose my job either. So I'm going to say, well, it cost me about 50 cents last year. <laughs> so we get all kinds of problems in trying to measure this, even if the person knows. And a lot of times we don't know what our costs are until we're actually faced with a decision to either incur that cost or not. How much would I pay for a hamburger at lunch? I, how hungry am I? I mean, would I pay $15 for a hamburger if I'm, if I'm really hungry? I don't really know. I, I don't really know until I make that decision. And of course, these costs will change over time. They're not going to stay constant. So even if you miraculously figured out what the distance is between these two lines, you figured out somehow what the, what the external cost is, how do you know that's going to stay the same over time. 
Maybe if I, you know, if I have a child, a small child, and I suddenly become more concerned about the impact of the neighboring factories' emissions on the development of my child, and maybe my, maybe I think that those costs are higher, uh, and so forth. So we have a calculation problem. Now, often you'll hear comments uh, uh, about overuse of resources. Uh, we're putting too much pollution in the air or we're putting too much pollution into the water. There, there's too much uh, fertilizer washing off into watersheds and causing algal blooms downstream and so forth. So we're, we talk about these, this overuse. Well, in order to have a meaningful concept of overuse, we have to have an idea of what the optimal rate of use is. Otherwise, it's meaningless. So you say, well, should, should we reduce pollution? And somebody you're talking to will say, well, yes. Uh, so let's suppose we did that. And then you come back to the person and you say, well, how much should we reduce pollution again? I mean, you, you, if you continue to do this, the optimal rate of pollution is not zero. That would imply that we would just, ha just have to cease to exist. I'm up here exhaling carbon dioxide and other things. I'm, uh, some people, CO2 is considered a pollutant. Does that mean that I should cease to exist so that, um, so that my production of, of waste products from the chemical processes in my body would then cease? So we don't really know where the marginal social benefit and the marginal social cost are equal. Back to my diagram here, the ideal from the point of view of most environmental economists is to locate this point, Q star. As you're increasing your output, initially the marginal private benefit of producing this good is higher than the marginal social cost. So we say, well, it's optimal, socially efficient, and so forth to continue to increase the, the output of this product. Well, we can, we can continue to do this until we reach this point Q star, at that point, any further increase in the output would cost more to society than it benefits the firm. If the firm doesn't care about the cost on bystanders and is only looking at the cost of timber, the cost of water, the cost of labor, and so forth, then the firm will continue to increase output up to QM. At QM, the firm will finally say, well, now if we increase our output, the cost to us would be greater than the benefits to us, so we'll stop there. We won't increase our output anymore. From the environmental, mainstream environmental economist perspective, that's, that's too much. Because at that point, the marginal social costs exceed the benefits of producing this product. And so the environmental economist would then say, well, what we need to do is, uh, I should say the typical environmental economist would say, well, what we need to do is somehow induce the firm to cut its output from QM down to Q star. At that point, we have social efficiency. Now, again, we don't know where that point is because we cannot measure those social costs. We can't measure those external costs. Now, the Pigovian tax approach which says we're going to tax each unit of pollution, let's say each ton of sulfur dioxide, by X amount of dollars. What's the X? Well, X would be determined by how far that marginal social cost is above the marginal private cost. The external, the cost on bystanders, we're going to then determine how much that is and we're going to tax the firm by that amount. And so you see uh, sometimes carbon tax proposals, which have been the headlines in recent years, are an effort in that direction. If they say, well, CO2 is a bad thing, we don't want to produce more of it, so we're going to tax fuels that have carbon in them. Some economists uh, have said, well, carbon taxes have some problems, but maybe we can instead use tradable permits. So we can say we're going to allow X number of tons of sulfur dioxide to be emitted into the air in the next year, and uh, so we're going to create a permit, one ton of emissions per permit, and then we're going to auction these off. This has been done. Auction these off. 
Uh, so firms that find that it's very expensive for them to reduce their pollution will buy a lot of permits instead because the permits will be cheaper. And the firms that say, well, it's, it's pretty cheap for us to reduce our pollution, so instead of buying those permits which look expensive to us, we're going to reduce pollution instead. Now this is appealing from uh, an efficiency perspective because this means that the Instead of applying the one-size-fits-all command and control regulation to all the firms, this means that the firms that face high cost to reduce pollution don't, and instead those that face low cost reduce the pollution instead. So this means that you get some efficiency advantages. Nevertheless, this is going to require government to do the impossible. It's going to require government to assess the ideal quantity of pollution permits. So um, if you choose a pollution tax, and you, you say we're going to tax units of carbon by some amount, well, you've got to figure out what that distance is, and then you've got to put that into dollar terms and impose that tax. Secondly, if you say, well, you know, maybe we're not real sure what the tax ought to be, and so uh, for whatever reason we think that that's, that's not ideal, let's use a market approach. Let's have tradable permits. Nobody likes taxes anyway. Tradable permits sound so flexible. It sounds so reasonable and efficient. I mean, and economists look at this and they say, well, you know, this, this, is, this is ideal if we can, we can sort of sort things out that way. Well, then you have to figure out this distance here. You have to figure out what Q star is, which again means that you've got to figure out where that intersection is. We don't know where that intersection is. Now, uh, you might say, well, you know, maybe, maybe we understand that, that we can't figure out exactly where that point is, but we, we do know that we're producing too much pollution, so we should reduce. Well, first of all, we don't really know that we're producing too much pollution, but even if you did that, if you, if you overshot and you wound up down here, you thought Q star was here when it was in fact here, if you thought it was lower than where it actually is, you can do more damage than, uh, than, you're, than the damage you're averting or avoiding. So it, it, it's, a, it's a very sticky kind of problem and not one that has... Um, has a good solution from a government intervention or policy perspective. Art Carden, um, I have a high regard for Art and his, his work, and, and um, he contributed um, a paper, I think it was actually a comment or a note, to the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics um, a while back. Um, we had a brief exchange um, uh, Dolan and, and Block were um, discussing environmental policy issues and, and Art weighed in on this. And he said, the calculation objection, which is what I'm talking about, the difficulty of determining exactly what these, these costs are, the calculation to emissions trading, calculation objection to, to emissions trading schemes is more than a simple how do you know conversation stopper. Finding the right amount of emissions to allow might require some trial and error, but credible commitment remains an important potential obstacle. What incentive is there for a state to specify a particular level of carbon emissions that will be allowed each year and then not change this in response to political pressure? Now, I would quibble with Art on this bit about trial and error. I, I, trial and error requires a measure of success and failure, and we don't have that in this case. Uh, yes, you can say that if you impose a higher tax, you get less pollution, but how much pollution is ideal? Again, we're back to the calculation problem, and uh, without uh, prices and profits and losses that are originating from voluntary interactions in the marketplace, um, you, you don't really have a way to determine whether the trial reduced, uh, uh, resulted in a better outcome or a worse outcome. Okay, so when the government's got its thumb on the scale, we don't really have a good way to determine where the proper balance is. Um, but Art brings up an, an important point, and that's 
political continuity. How do we know that the policy that the government imposed today is going to be appropriate, even if miraculously they came up with the appropriate policy today, how do we know that's going to continue to be appropriate next year or the year after that or even next week? So we don't know this. We're, we're living in a dynamic marketplace. We have things that are changing around us all the time. Policies tend to be static. They tend to, to be put into place when the political conditions arise to, to do that. And then the next uh, election comes along and the next group of politicians decide something very different. Firms that are trying to decide whether or not to make some kind of massive long-term investment have to take this into consideration. Do they reduce pollution or do they not reduce pollution? What, what should they do? How much pollution should they reduce given the existing policy environment? What's the policy environment going to be next year, the year after? They don't know, and therefore that makes investment decisions very difficult. Also, how do we know that politicians won't set limits that are conducive to exploitation by constituent groups? If you have this idea that politicians and the bureaucrats of the EPA are, are, are sitting there trying to honestly come up with the ideal amount of pollution for the nation as a whole or the world as a whole, uh, there's a great deal of literature, Austrian and otherwise, a lot of this is so-called public choice uh, literature, that indicates this is not what politicians and bureaucrats are really after. What do politicians, what do elected officials want more than anything else? They want to get reelected. Okay, and if that means that they have to sacrifice some broader, economic, uh, broader environmental goal in order to satisfy the constituents in their districts, that's what they'll do. Uh, so if the paper mill is pumping out a lot of pollution and the paper mill sends a lobbyist to the politician and says, well, you know, we're really important for jobs in our district, and yes, we produce pollution, but we also produce these these beneficial things, and by the way, here's a campaign contribution. Do you think that perhaps you could see fit to loosen the requirements on us? And at the same time, you might have other groups that come in and say, well, you know, we're, we're destroying our environment, um, and, and we that aside, here's a campaign contribution. Do you think you could see fit to uh, vote our way, and we'll make that known to our members of our environmental organization and... Uh, and, and we'll uh, make sure that we, we put you in a favorable light so that you win the next election. So you have these special interest groups that are, that are constantly putting pressure on environmental policy, and if we actually got something that was ideal, whatever that might look like for the, at the current time, it would be a happenstance more than a matter of of deliberation and consideration of science. Uh, if you want to look up that article by Art, um, What Should Austrian Economists Do? It's in volume 17. That's several years ago for the QJAE. Um, he's pointing out this um, calculation problem. I'll move on in the interest of time. Let's talk about this efficiency fetish. Um, if we could calculate the efficient quantity of pollution, where has that gotten us? If we knew somehow what Q star was, if we knew somehow where the, what the ideal amount of SO2 or uh, CO or some other pollutant might be, uh, now what? Uh, how does that trump property rights? The issue becomes an ethical issue. I shouldn't say it becomes an ethical issue. It's always an ethical issue here. How do we violate the property rights of another person? Um, it's not about exceeding some number in our measurement of parts per million. Rory Cordato says, pollution is therefore not about harming the environment, but about human conflict over the use of physical resources. Humans change the environment in such a way 
that it harms others who might be planning to use it for conflicting purposes. It's about competing uses of a resource, air, water, land, and so forth. Now, I'm, I'm running short on time, uh, I see, but let's, let's talk about this tragedy of the commons for a, for a couple of minutes. Some of you might recognize this setup here on the screen. This is a prisoner's dilemma diagram. And the tragedy of the commons, which is a term that a biologist, Garrett Hardin, came up with um, decades ago, indicates that if there is not uh, definite property ownership over a resource, that resource may be overused. That is, it will not be used in such a way as to maximize its output over the long run. So a classic example of this would be some kind of pasture land. So let's suppose we have two ranchers, Al and Bob. And Al and Bob have to decide how many of their cows to put out onto this common pasture land. The more cows there are on the land, the more grass gets eaten and the less in pounds of beef per cow you get. Um, so if Al and Bob both choose to put one cow on this pasture, then Al and Bob both get, let's say, five pounds of extra beef per day, added weight gain in their, in their livestock. That's a total of 10. And if they chose both to put two cows on the property, so Bob puts his two and Al puts his two, then Al and Bob get four pounds each of weight gain for their cows, total of eight. So the greatest long-term output for this pasture is if there are only two cows on the pasture and uh, they get a total of 10 pounds collectively across the, um, the two cows. Um, if Bob and Al put a total of four cows on the, on the property, then each cow is gaining only two pounds per day, total of eight. Okay, so here's where there's a problem. Let's say, let's say Bob is trying to decide what he should do. Should he put one cow out or two cows out? Well, obviously the, the weight gain depends on what Al does. So Bob's thinking, well, what if Al is going to put one cow out on, the, on this pasture? then that means if I also put one cow out on the pasture, I get five pounds of weight gain. But if I put two cows out, I get six pounds of weight gain. I think I'll put two. Al is making the same decision. He doesn't know exactly what Bob's going to end up doing, but he says, well, what if, what if Bob puts one cow out on the, on the property? Then if I choose one cow as well, I get five pounds of weight gain. If I put two cows out, I get six pounds of weight gain. I think I'll put two cows out. So both of them end up putting two cows out on the property. They end up in this box here with a total of eight pounds of weight gain instead of the maximized output that you would get if they both restrained their, their uh, putting of cows out to pasture and put only one cow out each. So we get an overuse of the resource, overgrazing, and we get less than optimal output. Carl Minger, whom you heard about from the very first night, uh, actually I think it was the next morning, uh, Monday morning, you heard Joe Salerno's talk on the history of the Austrian school, and he spent some time on Minger. Uh, Minger says, when all members of society compete for a given quantity of goods that is insufficient or scarce, a practical solution to this conflict of interest is only conceivable if the goods pass into the possession of some of the economizing individuals and if these individuals are protected by society in their possession to the exclusion of other individuals. So back to our diagram. If Al somehow comes into ownership of the pasture, it's no longer shared ownership, it's no longer common access, well, Al then says, well, I want the most output I can get from this property. 
maybe this means that, um, that I choose to put a total of two cows out on the property. Now, there may, it may be that they're both my cows. It may be that I put one of mine and I rent the pasture out to Bob, who also puts one of his. Or it may be that I don't put any cows out and Bob puts two. But in whatever, whatever arrangement we come to, the property is going to be optimally used if Al can say no more cows after two. And that results in a higher level of output. Now we come to Coase. The famous Coase theorem. Coase, last I heard, uh, his, um, um, his most famous journal article in the Journal of Law and Economics had more citations than any other article in the entire economics literature. So, and uh, won the Nobel Prize. I think that was in 1990. Uh, I want to say 90. Um, anyway, um, Coase said if you don't have transaction costs, that is the cost of negotiating and arranging a transaction, then the outcome, the, the, the amount of pollution generated will be the same regardless of the initial assignment of property rights. Now, transaction costs aren't zero. We know that they're not. And some people make this mistake. They'll say, well, in a Coasean world, and by that they mean in a world with no transaction costs, Coase himself didn't think transaction costs were zero. He, he, he knew this. I mean, so it, it's a kind of a straw man argument to say, well, you know, Coase was wrong because transaction costs aren't zero. Well, he knew that. So he said, well, courts then should balance the costs and the benefits of both sides and then make a determination. The decision of the courts is relevant when transaction costs are not zero. Now, the one of the problems with this Coasean approach is that it neglects the problem of subjectivity of costs and benefits. In the time I have left, I'd like to go through an example of this so that you can see this problem. Coase mentioned uh, a problem of um, steam locomotives going down a track, burning coal or wood or something, and emitting sparks out of the stack. Sparks land on fields and property uh, adjacent to the track, and as a result, fires destroy some of the output from those neighboring fields. So this is a kind of an externality problem here, negative externality. So let's, let's suppose these are orchards, and the orchards are being destroyed by sparks from the passing train. Let's suppose that the burnt property, or the property that's at least subject to being burnt, has lost market value as a result of this casting off of sparks by the train. So there's, a, let's say, a $100,000 reduction in the market value of the property. So a farmer has to suffer the loss of the trees, or at least the ability to grow trees, and the market value of the property is now $15,000. Not much else you can do with the property. Let's suppose that installing a device that would cut back on the sparks to prevent this burning uh, would cost $120,000. So should the sparks fly or should the orchard grow? What's the more valuable use of the property? Should we allow the railroad to proceed and using the space as a dumping ground for its effluent? Or should we allow the farmer to use the space to grow fruit? So the mainstream is going to look at this and say, well, $120,000 is greater than $100,000, so the railroad's use is more valuable uh, abatement of this, of this um, emission is going to be too costly relative to the resource that is being preserved. So growing trees would be inefficient. QED, no problem here. We just did the math. Now, we've said $100,000 reduction in the market value of the property, $120,000 cost of spark reduction devices. Now, here's where the Coase theorem comes into play. If, we, if, if there are zero transaction costs, let's suppose the court says, well, we're going to give the rights to the farmer. The railroad would then say, well, it's worth a lot to us to be able to continue to use the tracks, and the farmer is suffering a market loss of $100,000. So we'll just pay the farmer $100,000 so that we do not have to install the $120,000 spark abatement device and 
farmer loses the trees, but is compensated for that, and society as a whole is better off by $20,000. Now, let's suppose in the second case, the courts say, for whatever reason, we're going to give the rights to the railroad. Now, the farmer is not going to be willing to pay $120,000 to induce the railroad to install devices that would protect $100,000 of market value. It doesn't make any sense. So the devices are not installed, the trees are gone, society gains by $20,000. This is, this is Coase saying it doesn't matter what the courts decide. If there are zero transaction costs, you get the same exact result in both cases. Now, let's suppose that the land is not only valuable according to its market value, but it's got a subjective value, non-marketable, to the farmer. Maybe this is land that's been in the farmer's uh, family for six generations, or maybe uh, the family graveyard is on this property and, and losing the, uh, having the graveyard burned over every so often by sparks from the train is going to be very disturbing to this person. Or maybe, uh, for whatever reason, this is going to be uh, psychologically harmful for the farmer. Uh, maybe the trees are special. You know, my, my great-grandfather planted these trees. I harvest fruit from these trees. That makes me feel like I'm connected to my great-grandfather, and, and losing those trees would mean more than just the loss of the property. Now, this is, this is common, and this is not some sort of strange idea. Um, when I got engaged to my wife, I gave her a diamond ring. The diamond ring has market value. I would like to think that if the uh, that that my wife would not say, well, you know, I really would like to put some new carpet in the living room. Uh, yeah, this has got some market value. I think I'll sell this. It's got hopefully some sentimental value to her as well. So this this is not uncommon for this for the market value to not be representative of the total value of of an asset. So let's suppose now the railroad gets the right to the total market value. The property was only $115,000. Farmer's not going to be able to raise $120,000 to induce the railroad to install devices. So the devices are not installed. The trees are gone. In this case, society loses by $100,000 loss of market value plus $900,000 of psychological loss to the farmer and then, of course, there are the savings from the no spark reduction devices, so we, we factor that in, and we get a total loss to society. We can't really measure this, of course, but we, we could easily get a loss that is far, far greater than the savings. So a resource that is very valuable to the owner is then lost. So this is why Rothbard says we can't decide on public policy, tort law, rights, or liabilities on the basis of efficiencies or minimizing of costs. Now, I'm out of time. I'm going to, instead of going through all this other wonderful material about drones and radio waves and other things, I'm going to point you to uh, a few things that you can use to follow up on this matter um, the classic Austrian paper on environmental issues is uh, Murray Rothbard's Law, Property Rights, and Air Pollution. Uh, Bob Murphy mentioned this paper um, yesterday in his talk on the Paris Climate Agreement, uh, which is an excellent talk. Um, I'm assuming it's available on Mises.org, so you, you should take a look at that if you have not already. It's very good stuff there. Um, uh, Free Market Environmentalism by Walter Block. Uh, Roy Cortado's book that I mentioned earlier, Externalities in an Open-Ended Universe, and also uh, a paper in the QGAE from uh, a few years back toward an Austrian theory of environmental economics. Uh, you can also look at uh, the aforementioned Block, Dolan, uh, Cardin uh, discussion in um, an issue of about three years ago. Uh, so those are some places you can go to get the Austrian perspective on environmental issues. I'm sorry I don't have enough time to go through some of these other things. This is a massive amount of material we could discuss here. Um, I'll be available later in the week for office hours if you have some follow-up questions. Thank you very much. <laughs>